Welcome to Union Church of Pocantico Hills. It's the third Sunday of Easter. Welcome to Union Church Online. If you are on Facebook or YouTube, please leave a comment to let us know that you're here. For those of you on Zoom, please remain muted until the fellowship time which follows the service. If you have celebrations or concerns to share with the congregation, please note them in the chat room or comments section. You are cordially invited to the pastor's coffee hour on Tuesday morning at 8.30 on Zoom, and to Bible study on Wednesday evening at 7 on Zoom. Today's music was pre-recorded at Union Church by Richard Coffey, organist and music director, and by soloists Adam Goldstein and Jonathan Mildner. When the disciples were certain that Jesus was dead, he stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Let us watch for the risen Christ this day, bursting in with new life and new hope. Easter people, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.
us in our weakness, interceding with sighs too deep for words. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. What love you have given us, O God, that we should be called your children! What love you have given us, O Christ, that we should share a table with you! Forgive us when we act as if we were your only children, when we do not recognize your image in the faces of strangers, enemies, or friends, when we do not share our own tables, forgetting that we need each other. Forgive us, O Christ, maker of peace, and teach us to follow in your way. Friends, Hear the good news of God's promise. I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. pray. Living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of your risen word. Enliven our hearts now by your Holy Spirit, so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson comes from the first letter of John, the first chapter beginning of the first verse. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen, heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Thus ends the first lesson. Oh, 
Our second lesson comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter, beginning with the second portion of the 36th verse. Jesus himself stood among them and said, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, 
And he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's sermon is entitled, Body Matters. A woman lost her husband. He died of heart disease when they were still middle-aged. The men from the undertaker arrived to take the body away. The husband's condition had been critical for some time, and the wife had seemed prepared for his death. Up to that point, in fact, she'd been remarkably stoical. But when they began to take her husband's body out of the house, she was overwhelmed with grief and for the first time began to cry and sob. The home health care, care nurse tried to console her, saying it's only his body, his soul has gone to heaven. At that she wept harder still, saying, but it's his body I want. Bodies matter to us. There is a sense in which we really can't separate a person from his or her body. If the body of someone we care about is subjected to indignity or brutality, it fills us with horror. As a society, we spend enormous amounts of money and effort to recover the bodies of people killed in combat, or in accidents, natural disasters, or terrorist bombings. One of the special agonies we observed in the aftermath of the World Trade Center attacks was the uncertainty created because so few bodies were found in the days following 9-11. Ambiguous loss, the professionals call it, and we saw a lot of it in New York City in the fall of 2001. Oh yes, bodies matter. I think we know viscerally that they matter. It's wired into our nature. Yet philosophical and religious teachings over the eons have often encouraged us to believe that the body is just a temporary dwelling, a way station, or even an illusion, that it has no lasting significance. We Americans are singularly confused about this. On the one hand, we seem to be one of the most body-conscious civilizations that ever existed. Untold billions are spent each year on health clubs and exercise equipment, diet books and body sculpting, cosmetic surgery and revealing fashions. On the other hand, Americans seem to be eager for so-called out-of-body experiences as never before. Modern religiosity emphasizes the spiritual, so bookstores have whole sections on the supernatural, the transcendental, the mystical. The concept of reincarnation seems to hold a fascination for many Americans, who are perhaps not entirely aware of reincarnation's philosophical basis in indifference to the body. This confusion has entered the church. Burial in the ground was the only Christian tradition for 2,000 years. Only in the past century or so has cremation become fashionable. There's nothing wrong with cremation, of course. But I notice that the traditional Christian burial service, with the coffin present in the church and an interment later in a cemetery, is more and more infrequent. Instead, we seem to want to get the body off the stage. The New Testament church found itself in the midst of a society that, like ours, was mixed up about the importance of the human body. 
On the one hand, various strands of what scholars today call Gnostic religion were tremendously popular. Gnostics taught that humans are divine souls trapped in a material world created by an imperfect God. And thus, Gnostics believed bodily life is insignificant compared to the mystical marvels of spiritual experience. In contrast to the Gnostics, the Hebrew Bible and the Jewish tradition held that a person is a unity of body and spirit. Bodily existence is the only kind that matters. A person without a body is unimaginable. Well, here were two opposing views. What many early Christians did not know what to think. The Gnostic and other popular religious beliefs of that day, as of our day, were very tempting. Surely it was more spiritual to think of the body as being on a lower plane of existence than the soul. One could not easily expect to find the presence of the divine in human flesh. Wouldn't it be distasteful somehow, unworthy beneath God's dignity? Wouldn't it demean the deity to be trapped in something so corruptible, so material, so earthy, so, well, so fleshy? There was a lot at stake for Christians in this debate. Jesus of Nazareth was a man, but soon after his death, he was now being hailed by the young new church as Messiah as Lord. It was claimed of him that he was the Son of God incarnate, from the Latin incarno, carnus, flesh, God in the flesh. Could this be believed? The first letter of John was apparently written near the end of the first century for an early Christian community that was split into hostile factions, some maintaining that Jesus was God in human flesh, and others insisting that he wasn't, that God could not possibly have come in real flesh. The opposition said that it looked as though he did, but he didn't really. It seemed like a body, but that was an illusion. The underlying conviction of these opponents was the age-old religious belief, still alive and well today, that bodily life was of a lesser order than spiritual life. This was directly counter to the Hebrew conviction that there isn't any such thing as real human life without a body. So the author of 1 John wrote a message to counteract this confusion and to set perplexed Christians straight on what the incarnation really was. He begins with these words. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we saw it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. This is a fascinating passage on many levels. It's somewhat garbled in the Greek and difficult to translate into English, but the basic message is clear. God's life has appeared in the world in Jesus Christ in a form that could be heard and seen and touched. In another passage from this same letter, the author drives the point home. Beloved, he says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit which confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit which does not thus confess Jesus is not of God. The message is reinforced by the Gospel reading from Luke this morning. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples, who were scared to death because they thought he was a ghost. And in the Hebrew mind, a ghost was not a good thing to be. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. 
See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Thus John's letter, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have touched with our hands, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you. It's no accident that these passages are read during the Easter season. We are forcefully reminded of the Christian proclamation of the resurrection of the body, as we say in the Apostles' Creed. To this day, there is great resistance to the doctrine of the resurrection of the body in general, and the resurrection of Christ in particular. <clears throat> this resistance isn't just doubt that such a thing could happen. It's also because it seems so unspiritual. The resurrection of the body doesn't seem religious enough somehow. Surely what we call life after death isn't so mundane and prosaic as to include muscle and bone and lymph glands and blood vessels, not to mention what St. Paul calls the less honorable parts of the body. To be sure, Paul makes it clear in his teaching about the resurrection that our bodies will be changed. They will be different as Jesus' body was different. Yet the New Testament message of the resurrection is one that takes bodily life seriously. Bodies matter. The Christian and Hebrew scriptures alike are in no doubt about it. Our bodily life is just as important as our so-called spiritual life. That's why sexual ethics are so important in biblical faith. Bodies matter. They're not to be treated casually or disposably. The ultimate proof that bodies matter is that Jesus had one. The first letter of John insists on this, as does our Gospel reading from Luke. Last week's Gospel passage for this Easter season, you remember, was the story of Thomas, who says he won't believe until he sees and touches the wounds in the Lord's body. Faith in Jesus means that he really lived, really died, and really was raised from the dead into a new kind of authentic bodily existence that still bears the scars of his life as one of us. The temptation to spiritualize Christianity to direct its focus away from the world and its problems toward the imagined purity of a heavenly realm has always been a problem. The first letter of John was written in large measure to counteract this tendency. The test of true Christian faith is the claim that the Son of God took on human flesh. We need to understand what this means. Jesus didn't just come and inhabit a human body for a while, sloughing it off when he was finished with it. He actually became one of us, fully human during his 33 years of mortal life. And he became a bloody dead body, publicly displayed as unwanted rubbish. That's exactly what crucifixion was supposed to indicate. He became one with our condition in his total nakedness and helplessness. It was not a mythic religious ritual, it was the most irreligious thing that ever happened. The Christian claim that the eternal creator God paid the penalty for our sin in his human flesh remains unique in all the world. The extraordinary message of the New Testament is that Jesus has not just entered our condition in order to die alongside us. He has not entered into bodily human life merely in order to share it with us. In entering human flesh, he has actually overcome the enemy. He has won the definitive and final victory over all the ills that flesh is heir to. The Apostle Paul declares, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection life. The gospel depends on this. A Jesus without flesh and blood is not the Lord and Savior of Christian faith. Faith is the right word. 
The truth of the resurrection of our Lord is grasped in this life only by faith. There's nothing more powerful than faith. It has immediate and practical consequences. It makes a difference in how we live and how we die. The victory of the resurrection is enacted over and over again in the flesh and blood conflicts of this present world. That includes the great struggles for peace and justice and human dignity, to be sure, but it also includes you and me in our own mundane struggles against such things as bitterness, resentment, impatience, envy, small-mindedness. In spite of all the ambiguity and vulnerability of our fleshy nature, we are precious in the Lord's sight. For us, he has assumed that vulnerability. For us, he has undergone its consequences. And for us, he has been raised out of the grave on behalf of all victims and hostages everywhere, including ourselves and all our various bondages. At this moment, as we are gathered for the proclamation of this message, let us in heart and mind embrace the wounded hands and feet of our dear Master and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. All authority and power and dominion to the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ our Lord, now and in the age to come. Amen. for the needs of the world this day, please remember especially our elected leaders, first responders and essential workers, children and educators, and Josefina Abru, Mary T. Johnson, Erica Maniachi, and Byron Weaver. 
God has made the one who was rejected the cornerstone of a new community. In the name of Christ Jesus, let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Holy One, as the risen Christ opened the minds of the disciples to understand the scriptures, and gave them power through the Holy Spirit to walk boldly in this world. Open your people today to the healing, wisdom, and faith given in your word. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Prince of Peace, as Christ Jesus showed his wounded hands and feet to the terrified apostles, reveal to your church and to the people of prayer in every faith, the wounds of our neighbors, the fears of individuals and families, and the avenues toward healing. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Author of life, we beg for peace among nations, peace throughout communities, peace within families. Guide leaders and voters, legislatures and parliaments, judges and juries. Teach diplomacy and let our ways be formed so that all creatures, plants, and people may have plenty. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Light in our darkness, let your brightness burn in places shrouded in violence. Reveal the pains that are hidden in secret. Unveil the needs of our own hearts, so that we may know the power of vulnerability. Your Son was raised to life even from the grave. Show us again that life comes from death. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Healer of every ill, we pray for all who are in need, for refugees of war, and all who are displaced by storms, for rescue workers and medical teams, for those whose bones are weary, for those who show us the power of community to give hope to the frightened, and for all who have asked for our prayers. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You command us to bring to you our deepest desires, O God, and we pray now for those persons and concerns that lie on our hearts, spoken aloud or in silence. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Trusting in your abundant mercy, O God, we commend into your care all for whom we pray, and our own lives, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us be bold to pray together now as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory for ever. Amen. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods, yet refuses to help a sister or brother in need? Remembering God's great love for the world, let us offer our gifts and our lives to the Lord. If you would like to support the ministry and mission of Union Church, there are several ways to give. You can text UCPH to 77977 on your smartphone and tap the link which will appear. You can give on our website, www.ucph.org, under the Give tab. Or you can mail your check to Union Church of Pacantico Hills, 555 Bedford Road, Terrytown, New York, 10591. In whatever way you choose to support us, we thank you. 
Let us pray. Almighty God, receive these gifts that we offer with grateful hearts and use our lives for the ministry of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. serve our risen Lord. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all this day, and even unto the life everlasting. Amen.